mud to facilitate handling the pipe on the rig floor. The rubbers can be opened to full hole size or closed off completely when the pipe is out of the way to provide a hole cover. When the drill pipe is out of the hole, the automatic drill pipe stripper can be slid to the side for servicing. But with the drill pipe sticking up through it, the pipe stripper could not be moved. Since the lodge pole blowout, the manufacturer has redesigned this equipment into two pieces so it can be taken apart and slid out of the way even if the drill pipe is sticking up through it. Meanwhile, when the wind did blow, traces of H2S were carried far afield. Even though Edmonton is 130 kilometers from Lodgepole, its populace soon caught a whiff of one of the most unpleasant odors one can experience. I know, I was in Edmonton at the time, and it was an awful smell. It smelled, well, like H2S is supposed to smell in small concentrations, like sulfur mixed with rotten eggs. Back on site, Joe was proceeding with plan B. And as you can see, conditions weren't great. For instance, those puddles you see are not water. They are puddles of condensate, a hydrocarbon as volatile as lighter fluid. Condensate falls back to the ground as a liquid. On site, it mixed with the soil and turned the area into a quagmire. In places, it was hip deep. And that's what Joe and his crew worked in. On November 1st, he made his second try to control the well. Remember the rams in the blowout preventer? Well, plan B was this. Since the drill pipe was held in the BOP like this, Joe would quickly open the rams, the pipe would fall into the hole, then the rams would quickly be closed and control would be reestablished. Calculations indicated that the weight of the short portion of the drill pipe was sufficient to fall down the hole despite the pressure of the gas flow coming up the hole. The objective was to clear the rams so that even if the pipe flew upwards, the blind rams would still close. As it turned out, the pipe did fly up and in doing so caused a spark which set the gas on fire engulfing the entire location in flames. An attempt was made by the well control specialists to close the blind rams as soon as possible after ignition. Although the controls to the rams were activated, they did not close off the flow. Apparently, the control lines to the blind rams were destroyed by the fire, rendering closure impossible. From Joe's point of view, this was a serious setback. In the heat of the fire, the rig collapsed and fell on top of the existing blowout preventer, making it useless for future operations. Also, the tons of bent and twisted steel from the rig now had to be dragged away from the wellhead. This was a huge task. And though the crews worked 24 hours a day, the cleanup operation took two weeks to complete. The quagmire of mud and condensate quickly changed to swirling dust as the intense heat from the fire dried the ground. While all this was going on, the city of Edmonton and the village and towns closer to the well site were able to breathe a sigh of relief because during the fire, the H2S was burned off and the smell eliminated. Plans for a relief well were prepared even as the well-controlled specialists began their efforts to control the well at the surface. A relief well would have to be situated adjacent to the blowing well and would be directionally drilled to follow it to the bottom hole location. It was Amico Canada's opinion that a relief well should only be undertaken when a top kill proved impossible, since it would be a risky business to try drilling it while the blowout was spewing H2S gas and condensate. Further, it could easily take 80 days to drill a relief well. And even then, a subsurface kill would be an uncertain operation. After the site was cleared, it was necessary to snuff the fire. Dynamite is used to temporarily starve the fire of oxygen. The dynamite is positioned over the burning well on the boom arm of the athe wagon. This piece of equipment is the blowout specialist's most valuable tool. 
It is used to clear the area of rig debris, position the dynamite, and ultimately play a major role in the final capping operation. After numerous practice runs to get the alignment right and one unsuccessful attempt, on November 14th, the fire was extinguished. And the next day, Edmonton was holding its nose again. On November 16th, Joe Bowden was again ready to cap the well. After two days of careful preparation, he and his lead hand, Byron Lee, were working at the wellhead. The new BOP was carefully guided into the gas flow preparatory to bolting it into place. A thick fog of gas blanketed the area. Control of the well seemed imminent when tragedy struck. Byron Lee walked out of the fog, removed his mask, and was met by fellow Wildwell Control employee, Erwin Hoke. They moved to the end of the cat, and Byron collapsed. Within the seconds it took for the safety people to get there, Irwin's mask was also off, and he too had collapsed. Though both men were pulled to clean air and administered oxygen, Lee never recovered. Hoke was rushed to hospital, but later, he too became a victim of H2S poisoning. One can only guess, of course, but near the well, the fog undoubtedly contained many thousands of parts per million of H2S. Well, Byron, of course, was my number one lead off hand. And uh, he was a strong person. Uh, he was a, a special individual. Uh, he and I were just like brothers. And uh, Byron was a leader. And he loved to work. We knew what we were up against. Uh, we had talked about this happening to one of us a long time before this ever happened, and many, many times. And, uh, I don't know, we were ready for it. Uh, it's hard to say, but, uh, he was ready for it if something happened to me, and I was ready for it if something happened to him. Joe Bowden continued with the capping operation. On November 18th, the BOP, still hanging just inches over the casing bowl, was lowered onto the wellhead. But it would not seal properly. It had to be removed. Apparently, while hanging over the flow, a sealing ring had been damaged. Had it sealed, Joe would have been but a few bolts away from having the well under control. Because it didn't, Joe went back to square one again. Meanwhile, the news of Byron's death, plus the report that the town of Cynthia, 20 kilometers from Lodgepole, had reached the level of 13 parts per million. This information did little to reduce concerns in Edmonton.